I think it's fair to say, though, that just when you think you've got him nailed, he'll give you an unexpected point of view. It's been happening for his entire life, and this is just how he likes it to be. Christopher Hitchens has just published his memoir. It's called Hitch 22, and he's in Sydney to attend the Sydney Writers' Festival. He's in our breakfast studio right now. Christopher, welcome to Breakfast in the Flesh. Very nice of you to have me. Finally, a uh, pleasure to finally meet you. Uh, Christopher, I'm wondering what it was like to write about yourself for a change after years of writing about others interviewing others talking about others how hard was that harder than i thought uh, I, I wondered about halfway through why is this so difficult and i realized what it was it's usually when i write as you point out i'm making a case i'm making an argument sometimes it's a polemic an attack sometimes by the way i should say for myself i write quite warm and furry and friendly books too in praise of thomas jefferson for example or george orwell or explaining thomas paine's rights of man but at any rate, in those cases too, I'm making a case or an argument. When I'm writing about myself, I'm not really making a case or an argument. I'm not, it isn't written as an apology, for example. It's an account, sometimes an explanation, but more often just a description. So that's one thing. Second, normally I'm trying to see how much I can pack into, let's say, five or ten, or in long cases, you know, 20,000 words, mm -hmm. how economical I can be, how much I can get into that pint pot. With um, right with with autobiography or memoir, you keep remembering things you've completely forgotten, and you bung them down while you can, so it balloons out on you, it, it bags out, and you. I wrote twice as much as the publisher asked for. I imagine sometimes that process uh, must be so with any memoir, of um, dredging up the past and yes. trying to make sense of it is often quite painful, and it's clear that that is so. I mean, the book starts with the story of Yvonne, your mother, mm -hmm. which is clearly a very painful thing for a young man because Yvonne um, suicided when you were just 24 years old. Yes. How painful was it to go through that when, as you make clear in, in the memoir, you spent decades really going over and over the pain of that moment? Well, I realised I couldn't do the book unless I could get that done first because otherwise I'd be thinking about it all the time and perhaps leading up to it or partly suppressing it. So I just, I just open with a death in the family. Um, tragic one because she was young. She'd fallen in love with an unsuitable guy. I think he talked her into a suicide pact. I, I can never be exactly sure. I, I, that's my feeling. Well, you, the chapter sort of shows how I had to investigate it because it was initially reported as a crime scene, as a murder, mm. and I found that it wasn't. And you were the member of the family that went there, was in Athens. Yes, you flew in, there too. It was in Athens during a time of war and revolution as well, a very dramatic time of military coup and, and rebellion. So it was an extraordinary and very wrenching and lacerating week in my, in my life. Yeah. And, well, you've only got one mother. And no one is really being honest about themselves, I, I think, unless they, they write something fairly open about their parents um, at, at the beginning. You say in, in the book, I've intermittently sunk myself over the course of the past four decades or so into dismal attempts to imagine or think or feel myself into my mother's state of mind as she decided that the remainder of her life would be simply not be worth living. It's a very, uh, it must be a very difficult thing to do and to be stuck in. How stuck were you in that process well, of trying to get back to your mother's Quite a lot because of all the people one one could picture. Obviously, I'm the only person here who knew her, but... Very, very difficult to imagine anyone who, who, with such joie de vivre as she had, Yvonne had, coming to that literal conclusion, you know, I, I don't want any more of this life. I, you know, I've, I've looked up the road and I'm not willing to go there. It's just, it's a, it's a waste of time. It would be too painful to do. Very, very difficult to picture someone who is always so pro-life in every way uh, coming to that conclusion. I think I, I think I can make a guess. I think it, it was a bad time of her life to be a woman, if you know what I mean. I think she had been very beautiful. And she was, I think, in her own mind, ceasing to be. And she, I think she thought that the new lover was probably the last chance. And it wasn't working out. She didn't think she could get away with another one. So I, I, can, imagine, I can imagine that all right. And I can imagine it giving her the blues. But what I, what I do find still amazing is the thought that she decided to make an end of it. Uh, unless, as I say, he talked her into it, which I, is my provisional conclusion. She w while we're on this, I mean, I don't know if the it's a bit much for breakfast time for some people, probably even for me actually. But um, the, the the really awful thing was when I got to this terrible hotel in Athens and saw the crime scene. I, I did a lot of work to try and find out what had happened, and 
At the switchboard in the hotel, there was there was a record of her several times having tried to call me in London, and I've I, I was always out. I was a young man then, and I I'm very haunted by the thought that if she ever heard my voice, if she had got me, even if she didn't tell me why she was ringing, that she might have thought, no, I'm not gonna. And it's clear from the book that um, you, in a sense, believe that you owe your journey into public intellectualism to your mother. She was the one who fought for you to have an education when you really yes. couldn't afford it. You weren't sort of um, to the manor born. That's not where you came from. No, I'm the first member of my family to go to a university, for example, or to, or to go to a, a, a boys' private school. And I remember when I was quite small, you know how you're sitting on the top of the stairs and your parents are having a row? And I was eavesdropping, and the row was this, very simple. My father was saying, we can't afford to send him to this school. You know we, we don't have the money. And my mother said, look... Eric, that was his name. If there's going to be a ruling class in this country, if there's going to be one, Christopher's going to be in it, all right? And, um, I was so sort of silently cheering her on because well, I didn't know what ruling class meant, but I, I did like the idea of going away to school. And you have said that a public intellectual is in some sense something that you are rather than something that you do. Do you think that applies to you, that it was there within and would it have happened if you hadn't been sent away to school, for instance? Would it have emerged? Um, all I know about that is I, is I learned to read earlier than most kids did. But that was largely my mother pushing me, I have to say. But I, I was always ahead in reading age. And I always had an interest in a wide variety of books. And some I was lucky with some teachers, too. Bef that's before I went away, who would get me books in the library. There were no books at home. So, yeah, it could be that that was my bent in any case, yes. But knowing you've got a lovely woman on your side and in your corner is a huge, a huge start in life however poor you are.